And we are now live uh, for our industry insight with Athlete Soul. We're going to take a few minutes just to wait for everybody to join us this morning. I see people still coming in. Um, I'm Miriam Glaze. I'm the founder of Athlete Soul. I was a former synchronized swimmer at the Olympic level, started Athlete Soul last year. Um, wanted to give you a little bit of the housekeeping for this morning for our event. Um, this event is being recorded and you will receive the recording after um, its conclusion. You will also be able to see it on our website at athletesoul.space slash events. Uh, we are going to be talking with some fabulous speakers today. Uh, we have five, five guests. Uh, they're all working in sports performance, whether in coaching or strength and conditioning or in the sports science um, part of it. Um, and so if you have any question for our guests throughout the, the event this morning, you can absolutely ask them. If you could uh, go into the chat box or the Q&A and write your question in writing, in, um, in written, then we'll, I will be asking the question at the end of, of the event. So basically, we're going to be starting with some uh, Q&A &Q that I've prepared for all of our guests to discover a little bit more about the industry, but also their experience and insight into the industry. Um, and then we'll move over to the audience and see if you guys um, have uh, any additional things that you want to learn about. Let's get started, I guess, um, straight away. I'm going to start with Shika. Um, and um, Shika is, is um, in sports science. Um, she is the director of partnership at Silicon Valley Exercise Analytics, um, which is an exercise intelligence and sport analytics company. Uh, previously, she worked with USADA in, as the science uh, program lead. She was a competitive swimmer. Um, she's the only swimmer who represented India at the 2004 Olympics. Um, she has won 37 international medals, 146 national medals, uh, created 75 uh, national records for India. Uh, and represented the country for 14 years in swimming. So pretty impressive. Welcome, Shika. Thanks, Maya. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to move on uh, to Lindsay. Lindsay Gottlieb is um, the assistant coach for the Cleveland Cavalier. Um, she was the first female coach hired from college to the NBA. Prior to the Cavalier, she coached UC Berkeley for 11 years uh, with much success. Um, and before that, she was a collegiate player um, at Brown University, and then she studied abroad in Australia. I like that because I competed for Australia. Um, and then she moved into her career coaching um, after coming back from Australia. Welcome, Lindsay. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, next, uh, another coach, Dwayne Brook, is the assistant football coach at Dartmouth College. Um, Prior to that, he worked for uh, 20 years as a coach, 16 season in the Ivy League. Uh, side note, he coached my husband in football at Yale, um, and he was a collegiate player before that. Dwayne, thanks for joining us. Um, great long career in football coaching. Um, welcome. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. And we're moving to Kim. Uh, Kim Pop is also a sports scientist. She focused on uh, integrating um, te technology within high performance teams. She's currently the sports science lead for game groups. Uh, her previous experiences include lecture lecturing in biomechanics, uh, coaching diving, and working with athletes in Olympics, uh, action sport, and e-sport with Red Bull, the U.S. Olympic Committee, and Aspire Academy. She was also a collegiate diver at USC prior to her professional career. Uh, and finally, uh, Rachel. Rachel Hayes is the strength and conditioning um, coach at John Geyer. I'm not sure I said this properly. <laughs> High school in Denton, Texas. Uh, prior, prior to that, she was um, the women basketball and synchronized swimming strength and conditioning coach for Stanford University. Currently in her role, she oversees all of the women's sports um, physical training, as well as uh, the men's basketball, tennis, and cross country. Um, and I think that's it for everybody. Thank you. Welcome. 
Thank you so much for taking the time to join us this morning. Um, I'm actually really excited to talk about sport performance. We've covered a lot of different industries, um, but this is the closest, I guess, to the athlete's life. Um, so it'll be very interesting to hear how all of you have made that transition, um, what you've transferred from sport or not, um, and, and how is a career in sport performance. I think a lot of athletes think that they are very familiar with it, but it's actually a little bit different being on the other side. Um, so really, really good to, uh, to talk about it today. And um, I guess I want to start with the first question on, um, and that's probably a question for Lindsay and Brooks uh, to start with. Why did you choose to work in, in, as a coach? Um, and was it a choice, I guess? Um, often, I think some of the, the athletes move naturally into a, co a coaching position. So I'm curious on, on how the two of you uh, got started. And uh, may maybe we, get, we start with Lindsay. Sure. Um, was it a choice? It was definitely a choice for me. Uh, I grew up in a family uh, with a lot of lawyers and people in the legal profession. And I remember that our dinner table conversations were often about somebody's case or about sports. That, that was kind of the upbringing I had. And, and there was no pressure for my family to do anything um, in particular. Uh, I studied political science at, at Brown. Um, but while I was a collegiate athlete, I had so many friends who were competing, you know, in basketball across the country in different sports. And, and what I found is that their experience uh, was either really good or not so good. And that was informed largely by how they felt about their, their coaching staff or the team environment, right? It wasn't necessarily class sizes or what the, you know, cafeteria food was like, you know, or what the dorm looked like. It was the experience they were having every day. And so for me, um, in the kind of most simplified version, I, I discovered while I was in college, first of all, that coaching was a possibility, like that you, I was an X's and O nerd, I loved basketball. Um, and so I was like, wow, people get paid to coach. And at the same time, I thought it was a way that I could really have an impact on the lives of 18 to 22 year old, you know, young women. And I said, this is the perfect job for me. Uh, and so when I got back from Australia, I was abroad, uh, I, I actually went back to Brown for my senior year. I was a player on the team, but I asked if I could intern uh, in the office with the coaches. And, and during winter break, I wrote a letter to all 300 and something Division One women's basketball coaches and said, I want to get into the profession. And the day after I graduated, I got a job offer at Syracuse. So I went right into coaching. Um, I know a lot of basketball players play for a while and then get into coaching. For me, I knew I wanted to coach. Um, it was the impact on people and the X's and O's and um, it's been the only career that I've ever known. Wow, that, that's pretty impressive to be able to uh, know that so early on uh, when you were still an athlete and in college. Um, pretty impressive. What about you, Dwayne? How did you how did you become a football coach? Yeah, you know, um, growing up, I was immersed in, you know, basketball, football, baseball. That's all I knew, you know, and, and my, you know, as we got older, you know, when you go to gym class, I was always the guy to make up the teams. Right? So I would make the teams up, but I'd always have all the not so good players and myself go against my buddies. And they would listen to me and we would win. So I'm like, you know what? I could be on to something, you know? So when I went to college, you know, I was a, a poli sci, you know, public administration, you know, has nothing to do with coaching. And I think after I was done playing, you know, uh, going to my, I had a fifth year, but I couldn't play because I played my four. And everybody who, you know, I went to the University of Maine, Orono, so everyone who's graduated from Maine who wants to be a coach always coaches at Old Town High School. So I got my first coaching job in high school in 1987. I was, I was just finishing my senior year. I had one more semester left. And uh, I coached baseball, and, and I just said, you know what? Why would I ever want to have a real job? I don't want a real job. I mean, all my, all my friends have made fun of me forever because growing up in high school, they had jobs at, like, you know, the mall, the I just played sports and, and had to mow my lawn. You know, that was, that was my job. So I just couldn't see myself ever having a real job wearing a tie. Even though early on when I coached at Allegheny, we had to wear a tie and shirt every day, which was kind of ridiculous, but we had to do it. But uh, it's just, uh, like I said, it, it's not a job to me. You know, uh, it, it is I, every day I have fun, you know, and, and I get to, you know, I, people who are 18 to 22, are the masters of my life, 
but they actually, you know, listen to me. So it's kind of, it's kind of pretty cool because I, I think before, you know, because when I was a player, I'm not really sure if my coaches liked me because I really, you know, I didn't really pay attention to what I was supposed to do, you know, 90% of the time, right? So, and I, and I try to figure out how I can get them to listen to me. And, it, and for me, it, it's worked. You know, I, I, I don't, like I said, sometimes I giggle when I go to bed at night, you know, and, and, and then I'm coaching, and I just laugh. You know, then, you know, you, you asked me to be on this webinar and, you know, because of Todd, who, you know, that's my guy, but I, you know, I don't think those guys really think about me, but you, you make such relationship with people that it, it's worth it. But I said, I coach because it's not a job. And, you know, and I, it's just easy for me, you know, and, and the guys I've coached are, are, have been really, really good. And, you know, everybody's like, oh, you do a great job. And I'm like, no, it's not really me. They just make a decision. I just happen to be there. But I mean, yeah. it, you know, like I said, I coach because, like I said, I don't want a real job. I don't ever want to work for real. But, but I coach. I love the common grounds between the two of you, whether it was a choice or not. Um, it definitely is very impactful in the life of people with relationship, the way they're growing. And I think it's going to be a common thread in the call today. Um, so I'll go back to that in a minute. I wanted to ask briefly Shika and, and Kim how they got into sports science, because I think it's a little bit more of a process perhaps than it is if you're uh, going into coaching or strength and conditioning. Any of you want to start? Sure, I can go. Uh, so for me, it was, I mean, just being an athlete for 15 odd years, I mean, it's, it's one of those things where you know, you're trying to improve your performance and you're thinking about your body and you get to understand your body a certain way just through your training and competing. And so for me, it was something that was always on my mind, you know, like, how do I get my body to do, you know, just a wee bit more today. And, you know, that's how the seed was pretty much sown in terms of, you know, biology, biosciences and performance in general. And uh, that led to, you know, the interest in the biosciences, which I then went on to study. And then when I graduated from college, it was, you know, uh, an easy decision in terms of I want to combine all my uh, athletic experiences along with what I've learned in, in school and college. And, you know, I had a few options and, you know, I, after college, I went into anti-doping because, uh, you know, one, it was super fascinating. I had been tested multiple times in the, in the decades that I was swimming and I'd seen how the system worked or didn't work. Uh, and I wanted to be part of that change. I wanted to be part of, you know, being able to give every athlete a level playing field just so that their hard work could be appreciated in a way that it really should be. And so for me, that transition was more, like you said, it, it kind of builds on top of each other and your past experiences, you know, help you build that, uh, that first step and then the second step and you grow through becoming, uh, you know, uh, a career professional in the sports sciences. And even after uh, USADA, you know, the whole performance seed was just kind of sown in my head. And, you know, then when you start thinking about technology and the advances that we've had over the past few years, uh, you know, that the little things make a difference. So you start thinking about, you know, all the different avenues of performance and then having that science background allowed me to, uh, you know, understand the different avenues and the new technology and the new uh, processes that were coming in. And so it's almost like every day I was learning something new and just building upon that uh, uh, prior interest. And, you know, that's really how the whole journey came about for me where, you know, I know this is what I want to do. One, I relate to it. It's an ever-growing field. I'm never going to get bored. There's never a ceiling of, you know, I've hit 100% performance. It's every day you can improve a little more. And for me, that kind of helps drive that, uh, you know, just the mindset of loving work because it's never going to be the same every day. And you get to meet a lot of people, build those connections. And at the end of the day, like, you know, you, you're making an impact in someone else's life, uh, you know, be it an athlete or be it someone that's, just uh, looking to improve their, their health and wellness. Yeah, and it, it sounds like this was a continuation of sort of your career where, you know, you learned about yourself and your body and eventually you were deeper into this without the practice itself. I, thought, I think that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what about you, Kim? As you mentioned, it, it has been an exploration, right? So um, in college, I did athletics. And when I went in, I was 
I didn't know what I wanted to study. And people were like, oh, you should go to engineering. You're good at math and science. And I said, all right, I'll explore that. So two years in and I hated engineering, but I was already stuck in that, right? So, so I continued along that path. But I took a class in kinesiology and learned that there was the possibility to work and study sport. And I didn't know that before. And especially as being a young kid, when I was younger, I did gymnastics. So at 15, I started coaching. So that class really connected with me. Um, and so from there, uh, my dad sent me an article about the school and the, there was a professor who was studying diving. And so that was in the biomechanics lab and that was the perfect fit, right? So it was that kinesiology, it's mechanical engineering, which I was studying. And so it really tied in really nicely for me. And so I worked in that lab for the next three years. Um, and so from there, I, I knew I wanted to work in sport. And I didn't know what it was in sport. I knew that there was sport. So I did an internship in strength conditioning. That wasn't really exactly the right fit for me. Um, I did, it was 2008. So I went to London and worked in media for NBC that summer. That was definitely not it. Um, <laughs> so uh, from there, graduating from school, I knew there were a couple, a couple opportunities in sport in the biomechanics realm or sport science. And there wasn't a lot back then. I mean, the iPad wasn't even invented. Yeah, or maybe just about then. Um, so, so there was Nike or Adidas. There was probably the Yoso C as well. And so that was kind of what I set out on that path to see um, if there was an opportunity in those spaces in sports science, probably more specifically biomechanics for me. Wow. So, really, <laughs> yeah, really interesting to hear all of you and your different path and in, in how you got there with some very similar uh, ways to continue to help other or discover about your sport and continue to learn about, uh, about sports science and the body. I think it's, it's fascinating. I want to shift a little bit into um, how your work day and maybe even your season or your year look like, and maybe we can start with Rachel. Um, I'm curious to see as a, as a strength and conditioning coach, whether it's for your school now or when you were at Stanford, um, how does your day look like? And then past that, how does the season look like? Because I think, you know, in other profession, the work day is sort of drives the year, but in sport, it's pretty specific. And um, mm -hmm. I, I think it's very important uh, for any profession in sports performance. So I'd love to hear what it looks like for you. Um, well, it's pretty similar to uh, what an athlete schedule looks like. Um, you know, there's training early in the morning before school. Um, there's training after school late into the evening. Um, the middle of the day for me is a lot of planning, reading, catching up on as many current things as I can, um, you know, recording data. Um, and then throughout the end season, um, the perk of being in high school is I don't have to travel um, if, I, if I don't want to. So um, it depends on the sport and the time of year. Um, about December, January, um, my, lo my load just completely lifts because pretty much everyone's starting to get into either preseason or in-season situation. Um, through the fall, most sports are in their off-season period, so that's a really, really busy time, but it kind of mimics the way that an athlete's um, daily life operates, just depending on where they are in their um, yearly, um, their yearly um, cycle or plan, yeah. Yeah, and I think to follow up on, on your season and workday uh, for Lindsay and, and Dwayne, um, I'm curious how you guys uh, manage your family life and personal life with your coaching career. I mean, you, you're boss coaching in, in pretty high level. It's very intense. It's not, it basically is nonstop. You know, you're working all day, weekends. Um, and so I'm curious how this has impacted you over time. Um, and maybe this time I'll start with Dwayne, since you're uh, uh, been the longest in the uh, in this coaching role. How do you, have you how have you sustained this for so long? Uh, you know, like I said, I I think for for me it's I tell everyone I go. You know, when I started coaching at, at 21, it was it was yesterday, and I wake up now I'm 55. You know, so those days are sprinted by. And and you know you you said about you know how to handle my family and those things, football and coaching sports has become my family, you know? So I don't, I don't have, I haven't put time enough to make a real family, but you know, for some reason, the guys I coach, they thought it was great, you know, that coach was maybe a good guy. So I have 14 goddaughters and two godsons with those people. So that, that, those are my daughters, you know, so, and my two sons. So that's, 
you know, that, that's my, football is my family. So everybody who's ever played for me or every place I've ever been, and I've coached at six other places. So all those people I know, those are my people. You know, so I'm, you know, with this whole, it's funny with this whole COVID social isolation, I've been doing that my whole life. It's just that football has been the same, been the same for me. It's like Groundhog's Day, you know, but it's, every day is different, but it's the same thing. Same time schedule, you know, uh, I work, you know, every day, you know, we don't work Christmas, we don't work New Year's, and we have a week off in the spring, and we have two weeks off in July. That's it. For yep. running at the highest level, you know, so, I mean, just for me, it's, you know, just, you know, it's just, it, I mean, I love it. I mean, that's, that's what it is, you yep. know. And, 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 I, and I think uh, it's, it's pretty clear, you know, that when you take a career in, in coaching, just like you do as an athlete, you have to make sacrifices for the lifestyle that you have chosen. I think that's pretty obvious for everybody. I want to make sure like that athletes who are considering to move from athletics to coaching know that this will continue to be the case when they're coaching. And so you need to uh, be ready to be full into your coaching or perhaps have partners that are going to be accepting of your career and, and be flexible. And maybe, Lindsay, you can touch on that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's so important. I mean, there's a, there's a lot to hit on here. First, for athletes who want to go into coaching, I would say on the positive side, as Dwayne said, as everyone said, it's such a privilege to be able to love what I do. I mean, literally every single day since I was first employed at 21, I, I've said to myself, I can't believe I get paid to do this. On the other hand, the, other, the flip side of it is not a normal job where you clock out at five o'clock on a Friday and don't think about it again. I think sometimes athletes who get into coaching don't even realize it's actually more time than being an athlete because, you know, they show up and we give them a scouting report, right? Well, we've been working on that scouting report for three you know, days before. And um, I would often tell my athletes at Cal, you know, like, forget about this game. Let's move on. You know, you guys shake it off, but I'm not shaking it off. I'm trying to figure out what went wrong or what went right. Um, so there's no question it's a lifestyle job. I think in particular, what, what's really been kind of on my mind more recently is for women, I do think there's, there's this push to say, how can this be, um, how can your coaching dreams and goals align with being a mom or having a family? And, and, and Dwayne's absolutely right. My teams have become my, my family many times. Um, I have a three-year-old son. So my husband and I, like I was slightly older in the realm of, of having a child and I was already a head coach. So I was able to, you know, somewhat manipulate my schedule and bring my son to things. I would say I didn't become less accessible as a coach. I certainly didn't work less hard. It was more that I integrated my son into it. And college coaching is very 24 seven because of the recruiting, because of the nature of your practically parenting these young people that my phone was never off. Uh, there was not much of an off season with the shift to the NBA. That was something I was also conscious of, you know, they're, they're not used to having women, you know, in this uh, realm and to be able to advocate and say, okay, obviously I want to do the job at the high, high level, but I, it is important to me to, to also be a mom. Uh, there are some differences with the pro schedule. Uh, there, there actually is more time off. I, that was one of the benefits of coming to the NBA. I wasn't expecting a nine month off season. We're not in the bubble in Orlando where one of the 18 <laughs> got there. So this is too much time off. But there's a little bit more of an off season in the in the pros, but there's also more intense travel with 82 games. So I would say to to young people wanting to get into the profession, uh, it is intense. It is uh, lit, you know a lot of hours, and at the same time, there's no other career like it. I think where you can love what you do all the time. You just have to be intentional about how you want to make sure that you're able to not have to sacrifice you know, the other things that you want in life. I think you have to find a way to, 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 to build that, that in. And I do think the push in sport, particularly for women, is to be able to say, you know, we want women in the profession who also want to be, whether it be a mom, a, you know, a partner, a wife, whatever it may be. Great. Um, I love that you touched on, on all those topics. Um, I was actually going to ask you some question about this later on, so it's perfect you covered it. Um, <laughs> I want to move more into uh, some of the the personality traits and skills that athletes develop when they're they're athletes, um, and they can use in in the career um, once they work in sports performance. So maybe we can switch back again to Shiga and Kim. 
let's start with the sports science side. What have you learned as an athlete? What skills have you transferred over into your career now? Um, Kim, you, you, you want to start? Yeah, um, I think it's the adaptability. So um, the day-to-day -day changes, you never know exactly what's coming. Um, but then also your ability to manage a schedule beyond time. Um, your standard athlete things, I think plenty of people hear them. But I think really for me, the most important thing um, that I've learned in this field is say yes and then learn on the job. So say yes to whatever it is. You, you, you're coming out of school, you don't know how to do your job. You don't know how to do anything, really. <laughs> Sorry to say, but if you say yes, you have to learn as you go. Um, and I think that's the most important thing. And I think that comes as being an athlete, um, having the com confidence in yourself that you can achieve something. I think this is a fantastic advice because it's so difficult um, to get a, a, a job either in sports science or sport performance or as a coach. I mean, this is an industry that has hundreds and thousands and millions of people that want to get into it. So, you know, if you can differentiate yourself by saying yes uh, and then work hard to get it, I think it's, it's a great advice. Um, Shika, do you want to bounce off on Kim's comment? Yeah, sure. I think one of the things, you know, as an athlete, you're always learning, you're always striving to do just a wee bit better. And I think that for me has some, is something that has translated into my career as well, where every day is a learning experience, every day is a learning opportunity. And uh, I think just the ability to, to learn uh, more and more every day, I think uh, is definitely helping me because it, in two ways, one, I get a better understanding of the field itself. And then it's also helped me transition from different industries. Like I started off in anti-doping, which is very different from wearable technology, which is very different from sports science that I do right now. So just that ability to transition, having that confidence to transition, knowing that, you know, like Kim said, say yes, and, you know, have that confidence in your ability to be able to then learn and, you know, get to where you want to go. So I think uh, that's something uh, that skill set and, you know, time management, just goal setting and those kind of things have definitely transferred over from uh, when I was an athlete to what I do right now. Yeah. And uh, um, uh, I'm going to shift a little bit to the coaching side because there was very similar, a lot of similarities with the time management and goal setting and, saying yes and being available and um, being flexible. But for the two of you that are in coaching, um, it's one thing to be an athlete. It doesn't necessarily transfer as being a good coach. Um, so I'm curious um, if you could perhaps try to identify what made you, uh, what makes you a good coach? What did you get from the athlete side that makes you a good coach? Because we know it's not necessarily uh, obvious, right? Um, and maybe Dwayne, we can start with you because you talked about the fact that uh, a lot of your teammates or others were already following your leadership or your advice. So I'm curious what, what you think made you a good coach and what skills did you transfer to over? Yeah, you know, I, I think, you know, it's funny for me. I, I tell everyone that, you know, um, I'm the uncoach, right? You know, I'm more of the Montessori school. I actually had t-shirts made and, you know, I'm the Montessori School of Coaching where you have to find yourself, you know, and, you know, Kim talked about saying yes. I mean, but, you know, when you coach guys, guys have a hard problem following direction. I used to be one of those. You have a hard problem following direction, you know, so you have to reinvent yourself because you have to understand that people coming before you and behind you are just as good, if not better. So you got to find a way that you can be seen and still be good at what you're trying to do, you know, and, Guys don't always go all in. I mean, for five years, I was a head women's football coach. You know, I had a 97 women on my team. They were all in. They were too much in sometimes, but they would do whatever you told them. I, you know, you got to break guys down to do what you need them to do. You got to, you know, the, the women's side was easier. But I just think for me, um, like I said, I, I'm a Montessori guy. I just sit back and I let the older guys, I mean, for 31 years now, I've let the older guys take over the room because, you know, I become your parent. And you never listen to your parents, so why would you come and listen to me? So the older guys' coaches just kind of filters down, and, and, and that's the way I do it. I mean, I, and I always tell people, I go, you know what? Only you know if you're working. Only you know how good you want to be. And I go, for me, is when I was a player, you know, and I had, I had some really good coaches, and I, I think I took everything from every one of those guys, 
And but I always said, you know what? If I do, if I'm able to coach in college, what would I do? And I go, I would let people be themselves because we always want people to be the same. You know, when you're a coach, you're like, okay, you got to be that type of guy. You know, like some of the D-line coach, you say, you know, well, you know, you got to take this many steps. You know, that'd be six inches. But if I wear a size 15 and Billy wears a size eight, it's not going to be the same type of step. So you got to figure out how to get yourself and feel comfortable. It's all about comfort. And I, that's why I tell guys, you know what? After I mentally crush you and bring you back after a year and a half, then you'll understand what's going on. But, I mean, you have to find yourself. And that's how I coach. I mean, I don't, I mean, I don't uh, ask anything that, that doesn't need to be done for you to do. You know, if you, if you want to be really good, you'll be really good. I'm really, I, that's my thing. If you want to be good in the sport that you're participating in and if you work at it, sometimes if you work at it, it doesn't work out. But if you can go to bed at night and say, I've done the best I can, then we're in a good spot. There was some really good message. First of all, I love the expression of the Montessori School for Sport because I think it's a very clear image that we all understand on your approach to coaching. But I think it's remarkable that as a, a young man, you were able to reflect on the way you were coached. Not a lot of athletes are able to do that at that point. I think it happens later in life. Um, to be able to reflect on the way you were coached, take it all in, analyze it, and, and be able to teach others intrinsic motivation, uh, something that comes from within that will drive you for much longer and much stronger than actually uh, when it's imposed from your coach. So I, I love those messages. Uh, Lindsay, do you want to follow up a little bit on, on what um, Dwayne said? Yeah, I'll just, I'll just add this. In, in all my years working with college athletes, one thing I would say to, you know, to anyone who's watching this is that as an athlete, you have more on your resume than what you think. You're building more skills. So I would find that my college athletes, when they first sat down, well, I don't, you know, I don't do as much as my peers who are not athletes because they can do this internship and they can have this job and they can do such and such. But then we would start breaking down the skills that you do develop as an athlete and they're actually very translatable to the workforce. So I, you know, working with other people, being a leader within the team, being led within a team, learning scouting reports, having time management. So I do think to all the athletes on the call who are thinking about trans transitioning, the skills that you've built up through your time in sport are actually much more translatable to any workforce than you think and actually can be far more attractive to an employer than you know, somebody who's just been kind of on an individual path. So to, to my specific skills that I learned as an athlete that I think have translated, number one is, is kind of playing all roles. You know, I was a star in high school and I was on the bench a lot in college. And so I think having experienced many, being injured, missing a whole season with an injury, having dealt with off the court, you know, things, listening to my teammates, the, the compilation of those experiences made, made me more empathetic as a coach and more able to reach different types of people, I would say. Um, the other thing is just because I wasn't, there's a number, a number of different ways to be successful in coaching, but because I wasn't the star player, there's plenty of people who can be a great player and then just go translate and be a great coach. But because I wasn't, I spent a lot of time watching film, analyzing the game, breaking it down from that perspective, which those skills translated well for me when I became a coach. But more than anything, I think coaching is so much about the human connection, your ability to, um, to reach a lot of different kinds of people uh, to, to handle adversity and, and lead other people through adversity. And those are a lot of skills that I developed while I was playing and then tried to hone over my years in, in coaching. And I think those translate to any level you're coaching at. I think it translates to men or men or women. I think, you know, people ask me a lot about the transition to coaching men or in the NBA. And what I say is that the, the, the characteristics that high level athletes value the most transcend gender, right? They care. Do you know what you're talking about? in your sport like can you make them better and do you care about them as a human being and and those are skills i think uh you know we can learn as an athlete and then hone even more with your coaching experience yeah and, and i think uh, you mentioned that you were on the bench a lot in college and <laughs> i'm sure that gave you time and perspective to also observe the 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 coach <clears throat> sorry the coaches the coaching staff how they interacted with the athletes the game from outside um i think those are really interesting opportunities as an athlete is that we don't always see as an opportunity because you're injured and you're often angry that you can't play, but it's actually a, a well 
um, if it's well used, it's a great time to um, to to build up on your skills and and your, your knowledge of the game. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Rachel, can can we move to you now? And uh, you're in a field that's extremely competitive. Um, yeah. There's a lot of people that want to work in strength and conditioning. Uh, that come from a, a sports background or not. Um, so I wanted to ask you, what are your recommendations first in terms of like what to study uh, in college and then past that, um, you know, what, what position, how do you find a pass and how do you differentiate yourself as well? I guess th these are three questions in one. <laughs> yeah, you, you might have to remind me of them because I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna get off on a tangent and forget. Um, <laughs> I would say as far as what you study in college, um, you, you know, you could run the gamut of any of the, of the sciences. Um, I think if you have a basic good grasp of biology or physics or kinesiology, I think that you're going to be in, you know, a good position uh, because um, from there, it's just you need to gain experience, kind of like um, you've all touched on. Um, say yes, um, look for learning experiences, start getting experience however you can. Um, volunteer to observe your strength coach if you have one now, um, ask questions, ask lots and lots of questions. They're not stupid. Um, it can be, you know, the most basic thing. You're going to learn something from it. Um, and so you're going to have to remind me the third part of that question. Um, so I was asking you what to study experiences and yeah. how do you differentiate yourself? Um, yeah, so differentiating yourself, um, I think, is going to be a lot of you saying yes um, and volunteering to learn, um, not being scared to step way out of your comfort zone, um, learning about sports that, you know, that you don't play, um, being present. You know, if you're really wanting to learn to train athletes, um, you're, you're not going to necessarily be able to pick and choose what you train sometimes um, in, earlier in your career. So trying to, trying to gain perspective and be able to then connect um, – you know, general experiences to specific experiences is important. So I think that's one way you set yourself apart, um, for sure. And and um, I was going to ask uh, Kim and, and Shika that question as well on, on when you go into sports science, uh, or if you want to go into sports science, maybe that wasn't the goal in the first place because you studied engineering, uh, Kim. But I guess... Um, uh, if someone knows that's where they want to go to, uh, what would you recommend in terms of what they do in school and then experiences or internships after school? Shiga, you want to start? Sure. Uh, you know, like, like Rachel mentioned, like I think having a basic understanding of, of science for me has definitely been beneficial because, you know, uh, if you think about sports performance at the end of the day, like it's all based off of science. And uh, so if you have that basic understanding, you can always build upon that and it helps you understand different avenues, different nuances of technology as well. Uh, and I think in terms of experiences, you know, like, like Lindsay mentioned, like as an athlete, you don't necessarily have the time or the opportunity to go do internships and build, uh, you know, that, that work experience. But from what I've been able to do, you know, straight out of college as well was start volunteering at like different nonprofit organizations because they're always looking for help. And for me, that was a great way to build my skill set, uh, even in things that were outside of, uh, of, of the sciences. Like I, I learned business development by, by volunteering at a nonprofit. So, you know, it, it worked both ways where I learned something and I was able to give back to the community. So I think that's something that I would definitely, uh, uh, you know, advise uh, athletes to do. Like there's always opportunities to give back and, and learn in the process. And uh, yes, I think those would be the, the two main things like, you know, science, keep learning and, you know, find different opportunities to, to learn and grow. And right now we're all at home. We're all, uh, you know, have the, the time to, uh, you know, to upskill and there are enough online courses. There are, there's enough resources and material online. So I think make the most of that. You may not be able to, you know, apply all of that immediately because a lot of sports are still, you know, haven't started yet, but gaining that knowledge never hurts. Uh, the way I look at it, you know, learning never goes to waste. You never know when you're going to use it. And so, you know, when you have the time, even if it's just 15, 20 minutes a day, just make use of the time, make use of it well, because in the future it will come back and be beneficial. 
Great. I love that. Um, and it, you know, it's the same in coaching. It's ongoing learning. It's the whole industry is based on ongoing learning and ongoing improvement of yourself. So that was a great message. Uh, Kim, do you want to add to it? Yeah, I think in terms of studying in school, I think, as you mentioned, I said engineering, and that wasn't necessarily what people would think is related to sport. But I think any subject you study could be related. I think if I didn't study engineering, I wouldn't have had the opportunities that I have. It wouldn't have differentiated me from other people that are in the field, um, especially on the very technical side. Um, but if you like psychology, guess what? There are fields in sports science that are psychology based. Um, if you are studying business, um, I'm sure there's an avenue into sport performance as well, but maybe, maybe you want to go to the business side of sports. So anything you study in school can relate to any part of a business in sport. Um, so I don't think that that shouldn't put a stop to, to your exploration and your interest in the sports field. Um, for me, my continuing studies is in the science of coaching, um, because I think as a sports scientist, the relation to coaching is what's really important. They should be the ones driving the questions that you're answering um, because they're the ones who are helping the athletes. Um, and it's, it's not a sec. It is a science-based field, but it should come from the source and you are helping the coaches. Um, and so I think the last thing for me is that if you have the opportunity, like Rachel said, um, you're probably going to have to learn sports that you don't know anything about. So if you are with the athletes and you have an opportunity um, and you're at practice every day, they most of the time are very happy to teach you about their sports. So if you can get out there and learn to kick a ball, or if you're working in a velodrome, right around that velodrome, it's scary. <laughs> um, but yeah, take the opportunity to learn the sport that they're doing and you connect with the athletes a bit better that way as well. So. Yeah. And uh, we actually got a question for the two of you. Um, um, and it's about whether having a PhD in sports science um, can be a way to distinguish yourself in the field uh, and in the industry specifically like for for you and your job um, as sports scientists would a phd in sports science be something that that can um, differentiate yourself or dis distinguish yourself i think that's a, like it's a loaded question right our mm -hmm. our industry is based on phd so the development of sports science in the u.s there wasn't a lot 10 years ago and it's really developing especially in the major sports right now and there's more and more brought in. Um, a lot of the people that were originally coming into that field were from overseas because we didn't have the educations here. Yeah, there was a lot of strength and conditioning. There's a lot of strength and conditioning at the college level, but your physiologists, um, your biomechanists, things like that are coming from overseas and they have those PhDs. And so that, that distinguishes them to give them that higher level. I personally, I don't have a PhD, so I'm biased, um, <laughs> but but for us in the US, it's a little different, right? The PhD process in Europe is three years. So you could do a three or four year undergrad and then you do a three years of a PhD. Whereas here you're doing a seven, maybe up to seven years in a PhD. Um, and that's a lot of time. Uh, and you're, it's just the way that it's structured. So for me, experience was more important. Um, and, and I thought it was more interesting and fun than sitting and doing research. So um, I think you can go any avenue, but it needs to be the right one for you. Absolutely. And of course, we're not going to devaluate the value of education because it's, you know, you can't do that. It's always good to have more good education and more education. I think it's really what you do with it um, and yeah. how you use that to your advantage, right? But you do ask, and I think it is a differentiator in that application. So if you, if you are applying, then if you're applying and you don't know the people, that baseline could be a PhD. So um, any job I've gotten is through connections to other people, really. Like I maybe twice have applied for a job without having that connection to other people. So for me, that PhD hasn't been an issue. But if you are cold applying and that's their baseline, you're probably out of that bucket. So it just depends on how you go about the job. Well, least, and I was, I was going to react to this too, because I think uh, through your, your study and your research, um, it's a good way to actually network within the industry and start making those relationships that you would need later on. So uh, the PhD can be a differentiator uh, through the different resume that an organization receives, and then it could be a way also to create a network. It'd be published and a name for yourself in a, in a niche or a specialty. Um, so, you know, it does seem to be a... Uh, I didn't answer the question, but <laughs> maybe she has a more direct answer. <laughs> um, 
I wanted to bounce back a little bit on uh, what Dwayne had said at the beginning, and this is a question for all of you. Um, and uh, I wanted to ask you, what's the best part about your job? And try to be like as uh, succinct as possible. We can go through each one of you, uh, and maybe we start with Lindsay. Uh, what's the best part about being a an NBA coach? Oh my gosh, uh, it's so much fun. It's the highest level of basketball there is, and it's um, a really progressive league with a bunch of interesting guys. Um, and for me, I loved what I was doing at Cal as the head coach, but to be able to pivot at you know a, a height of my career and almost be just in a think tank of basketball and get new experiences with new types of people and challenge myself in that way, um, you know, it's just a lifetime experience that I, I never, you know, probably would have dreamed of, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. Um, but the number one thing I would say that I love about coaching in general is the ability to impact other people uh, and help them achieve, you know, their individual goals that might be higher than they ever thought. And then to help a team collectively do something, you know, that that's greater than any individual could achieve alone. That's just the beauty of coaching to me. Yeah, you've summed it all. Uh, we'll see if we have any, anything left for everybody else. Um, Shika, what's the best thing about your job? Uh, one, it's never boring. It's an ever-evolving field. Uh, you know, I get to work with uh, athletes who are, you know, multiple world record holders who uh, right from there to, you know, people who are recreational athletes and everyone you know, wants to get better. Everyone has the, you know, the potential to get better. And so just the ability to be part of that growth and part of, part of that constant improvement is just super exciting for me. And, and that's really something that I love about it, that you be, get to be part of someone else's uh, journey and watch them, uh, watch them get better. Yeah. Rachel? Um, I'm going to bounce off Lindsay's a little bit. Um, it's fun to get to go to work every day. It doesn't feel like work. Um, I sometimes ask myself, wow, I get paid to, to do this. It's, it's a dream to go to work every day. But um, like she said, you get to help be a part of something bigger that um, you contribute a piece of yourself to, um, whether that's the individual athlete or it's a team. And so in my case, you know, I have eight teams. I'm lucky I get to be a part of each person on that team and each team's success. So um, it's just, it's an indescribable feeling to, to witness success and think that you were able to at least help, hopefully, achieve help that person achieve that or that team achieve that i love the thread that we're getting from everybody on on similar topic uh kim do you have anything you want to add the best thing about your job i think, I think it's along the same thread of, i just love sport and so it's given me a lot in growing up and opportunities that i never thought i would have had and kind of developed me as a person so hopefully i have the opportunity to give back to to what has helped me develop so <laughs> Dwayne, do you want to add uh, anything to the fact that it's not a job and you love it? Yeah, <laughs> What's the know, best uh, part about your job? I get to be 18 to 22 every day. I haven't changed. That's I, awesome. I've never left college. You know, I mean, that, that is the best part. You know, I mean, I, I've never left. I see it every day. You know, I mean, it, it's, I get to be all four years of college every single day. You know, I think this is a very good point you're making also in the sense of like it, it's keeping you sharp and dynamic and in touch with the younger generation and, and what they're feeling and, and you know what are the, their challenge every day. So it's kind of interesting to be able to have that relationship that you don't necessarily have in any other job of working with um, that age group um, in a mentorship type of relationship. It's really exciting. Um, well, now I'm going to move on to the part that's not maybe as exciting, but I wanted to know uh, what are the most challenging part of the job and, and how do you, you deal with it? So um, maybe who wants, anybody want to start for this one? Um, Rachel, do you want to start? Or Lindsay? I knew that was going to be. Okay, go for it. Um. <laughs> I'm really blessed um, at my school, so my administration, um, my head coaches, I have a lot of support. Um, so that's really not a challenge. Um, I will say that the field of strength conditioning is, um, is challenging to move uh, within. Um, so 
like I talked about in the beginning, just trying to experience or garner as much experience as you can, um, working with a, uh, diverse sports, building your background, help yourself, um, be able to, um, move if you need to. So that's, that's one thing that, uh, it's just difficult to, to, uh, the job market and so forth. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, uh, um, these are pretty well known, right? It's a crowded field. You got to be willing to move around the country, take different positions in different locations. Um, that's something you have to be ready for. Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and constantly learning, uh, different jobs under different coaches with different philosophies. Right. And that's um, a good point. Yeah. Um, you know, um, I've been all over the country and I've learned different, uh, different ways to train athletes and I'm a melting pot of that. Now, um, I pull out of my toolbox and use it with different athletes. Um, just depends on the situation. So yeah, just, um, making yourself, um, a really good generalist is a good idea. Yeah. That's a very good point. Uh, Lindsay, you were going to add to, uh, yeah, to I would question. say to try and hit a couple, you know, of the, the, the big ones, I would say, you know, you mentioned it unpredictability. Um, it's not the career to go into if you just want to be able to line up your life, you know, there's, there's moves involved. Um, particularly in college coaching, you're often, you know, at, at the whim of decisions of not even 18 to 20 year olds, but 16 year olds in recruiting. Uh, recruiting is a kind of a animal unto itself. Some people really like it. Some people don't like it. I did not get out of college coaching because of, I didn't like recruiting. I didn't mind it, but now being out of it, you realize what an impact it has. Um, so there were times at which, you know, your level of success is not just on how much you know, or how, how good of a person you are, or how, you know, the, the, the way that you coach it's on, you know, the, the, the recruiting thing. Um, so that's something to think about the pressure. It's a very public, you know, a lot of times you're judged on wins and losses and things beyond your control. Those are just things as a coach, you have to just learn to deal with. It's part of it. And I think you have to set up your own mental health things that you need, your releases, your, your things that keep you grounded. Um, and then I think the work-life balance thing is is a challenge again there are many wonderful things about it right the, the fact that your teams become your family but I do I do think for some people uh the coaching profession if they don't kind of navigate that can can be challenging so those are some I think the challenges that just come to mind um immediately in addition to just it's tough to get a job it's you got to work your way up you know like any profession you don't aren't doing all the things you want to do right away uh, so it's, it's, you know, the nature of kind of getting where you want to be ultimately and then keeping that job. Yeah. Uh, actually, I'm going to bounce back on your, um, on your uh, answer because we got a question from someone who is a counselor um, and he's asking, um, he's curious on how do you as coaches make sure your athlete mental health is stable and they're doing great? Um, so wanted to ask that question following what you just mentioned, uh, Lindsay, and uh, maybe that's a question we can uh, have uh, you and, and Dwayne and, and perhaps Rachel um, answer. Do you want to start, Lindsay, and then we pass it on to Dwayne? Sure. It's such an important question, and I would say over maybe like my last eight or so, five, six, seven, eight years of coaching, it's become such a primary thing. The first thing I would say is to normalize sports psychology and mental health check-ins. What I mean by that is every college and every pro team has trainers and strength coaches. And, you know, you, you, you go to the trainer, whether or not you're the, the strongest player on the team or not, you work on your free throws, whether you're shooting 85% or not, you know, you, you often ice bath, even if you're not injured, right? I think in the same realm, everyone should have a sports psychologist just kind of as part of their daily Things so that it's not crisis point when someone's like, okay, I, I'm, I'm, I'm having real troubles. That would be my first advice. Um, I also think as a head coach, uh, you have to have a staff uh, of assistant coaches that you know has a good pulse on the team as well as yourself. So you, you have an early sense of if someone is struggling beyond just the normal struggles of sport. I think one challenge for coaches is that you know, it used to be, okay, there's a freshman that comes in, they were averaging 20 points a game in high school, and now they're coming off the bench, and it's hard, right? You just tell them, you know, work harder, figure it out, and that was it. And now we have to decipher, is the person having normal freshman struggles, or is the person really having a potential, you know, mental health issue that needs professional attention beyond the coaches just saying, work harder. So I think that we all have to 
acclimate ourselves with the tools to recognize that as coaches. Um, what I would always feel like as a basketball coach is that I'm not the strength coach. I don't have the scientific training, but I have to speak the language because I'm the first point of contact with the, with the players. So similarly with sports psychology, you know, I hired a sports psychologist when I was at Cal. We, everyone in the NBA has a full-time sports psychologist. You know, you can make it a performance thing. You don't have to be struggling to go see the sports psychologist, but I had to normalize, you know, become familiar with the language so that I could be a good conduit to the players to be able to use every resource available. So I would think that's the most important thing that as a coach to not make it a negative, right? You, you, you make uh, mental health and psychology as part, uh, as important as physical health and training mechanisms that you're using otherwise. And I can add something to that. So a lot of what we do is, you know, helping athletes, uh, you know, assess their daily just readiness levels. And it's not just from a physical readiness level, it's you, we, you know, help them assess uh, mental, emotional health as well. So because when you come in every morning uh, for practice, I mean, you're physical uh, readiness, your mental health, as well as your emotional status all comes into play. And I feel like it should be a collective assessment versus everything in isolation, because, you know, that's when, because all these different factors come into play. And if one thing is slightly off, then it's going to impact the other two. So I think just, you know, like Nindi said, normalizing it and giving athletes the, the chance to sit down every day and think about the different aspects of what encompasses health, I think is really, really crucial uh, to, you know, helping them understand themselves a lot better. Thank you, Shika, for adding that, because you and I have had that conversation on, on wellness, general wellness, and encompassing all aspects of health. So I think it's great that you added that. Uh, Dwayne, do you want to add anything to the mental health side? Yeah, uh, you especially know, I'm, in football, old, maybe? So, you know, I'm yep. old, so, you know, uh, I, I, you know, I played football before Nike and, and all that stuff, so back when I played, you know, you you never spoke to your coach. You know what I mean? That was a guy, you never spoke to him. You said hi to him, he said hi to you, you went to practice, but you didn't go to his office. You know, and I said before that, you know, I took away from one of my coaches, I you know, if I ever become a coach, I know you're good enough to play football for me. We don't have to talk about that. But if you want to talk about something else, come to my office and we'll sit and talk. So my office now has become a place where people just come and talk. We don't talk about football, we talk about, you know, your girlfriend, your parents, you know, we talk about everything. But I mean, because kids today want to, there's more to their life than just, you know, than just a sport. So sports are going to end. Back when I played, we thought sports would go on forever. And I just happened to be in it forever. But I mean, it ends at some point. But, you know, and like I said, I tell my guys, I go, I recruited you because you're a good player. At some point, you have to be a good player. That's great. I go, but we can talk about other things. I mean, I might know something else. I'm, I probably don't, but I'm a good person to, that'll listen. You know, and that's what kids want. People, kids just want people to listen. You know, and I found in my, you know, now my 33, I'm really dating myself, 33 years of coaching, right? That, you know, even when my guys, you know, they would come see me, then they would tell their friends in the college. Now I have everybody who comes to see me. You know, it's like I'm some type of guru of what's right. I mean, I'm, I just, I'm just not judgmental. I just listen. You know, I mean, because I, I wish I would have could have talked to someone that way, but I couldn't, I couldn't, I mean, I couldn't go to my D-line coach and say, you know what, man, my girlfriend, you know, she broke up with me. He would just look at me and tell me to go out and, and go running or something, you know, run it off. Or, you know, now kids, you know, they really, I mean, you know, kids take, take everything personal. You know, I mean, I'm an old school guy. I didn't take things personal. My coach yelled at me and called me bad names. I knew he was just trying to light, you know, ignite the ignition. But now you have to know who to, how to talk to kids. You say, you know, you can't say anything that you can't say everything to everyone. You can't say that. You have to, you have to choose people that you know could probably take it. But you, you know, kids aren't like that anymore. You don't have to have the iron fist and try to choke a kid to his knees <laughs> to get him to do what you need to do. You know, I, I think now it becomes the, you know, rubbing people's back. I think, it, you know, I become a four prong coach. You know, when I first started, I was your brother. You know, so you, you always fought with your brother. You fought with him. You argued with your brother. Then I became your uncle, funny, your uncle, you know, give you a beer on the side. You know, then I became your dad. You had to be more mature. You had to listen, but I'm your dad. You know, I, I would never tell your mother I let you smoke a cigarette, you know. And now I'm on the other side of midnight where it's over. I'm, I'm now your grandfather. Who does not like the grandfather to come talk to you? So 
that that is that is my my whole thing. But I'm the grandfather. So it works, at least for me. Well, I don't know if you're the grandfather, but I think the idea of having an open door policy and considering the whole athletes and the person first, right? And I mean, this is this is what you're talking about is is valuing those individual outside of their sport and not just as athletes and understanding that um, their well-being, their mental well-being is as important as their physical well-being for them to be actually performing on the field. So um, I, I love the image of the different uh, role model that you play with the athletes and the, I guess the different season of growth that they, they'll go through. Um, we're actually starting to run out of time. So I wanted to ask one last question to everybody um, sort of to conclude. Um, if you had uh, one piece of advice to give athletes who um, right now who want to get into the sports um, performance industry. And I put that in the context of uh, COVID and the pandemic and the fact that, you know, the industry is struggling right now and it's already an, an, an crowded industry. Um, any advice you would give athletes on, on how to get into it and um, set this, themselves apart from the competition? Lindsay. Sure. Um, it was said before, but I really want to hit on it. Um, I think the best thing, uh, avenue that athletes have is net networking. Um, use your experiences as an athlete to talk to as many people as possible, to ask a lot of questions. At, you know, if you're at a competition, ask people what they do. Um, you know, working in the NBA, you know, for the Cavs organization, I've been amazed at, you know, we have analytics, we have photographers, we have business people, we have marketing. You know, there's, there's 50 different types of jobs that you could have. And I imagine athletes you know, when you're focused on your competition, you don't always see the, the, the entity that goes on around you. So if you're nearing the end of your career, use, you know, your status as an athlete to just ask people, you know, what they do and build your network. I think that's the most important thing because getting jobs in sports is less about the degree you have necessarily and less about what your resume says and more about who you know and who knows you. So uh, I, I would say use every opportunity to network that you, that you possibly can. Yeah, I think that's a great advice and, and not always thought about, especially in the context of like elite sport or professional sport or, or college sport. I mean, in college, you can see any type of job. You just have to go and talk to people. Uh, Kim, you were going to add to it. Yeah. so Just to add it. to that, if you are an athlete right now, say you're in college, you have all these people that you can go to. You, you, you can speak to your SNC. You have your ATC. Even there's sports information if you're interested in writing in sports. There's all of these different groups that, that are working within your organization. Even if you're on a, a USA team or an international team, that within your team, there are people working in these in different fields, and I'm sure they'd be happy to talk to you. But one thing I loved was Lindsay said earlier, especially in this time, that could be relevant, that she wrote a letter. She knew what she wanted to do and wrote a letter to every division one coach and said, Hey, I'm interested. Can I work with you? I think that's an amazing idea, especially now when you don't have these opportunities. Hopefully, I mean, at least one person writes back and that's all you need. So I thought that was really cool. Absolutely. Shika, do you want to share your, your advice? Yeah, just that, you know, there's no single path to getting into sports and sports performance or sports sciences. Like everyone has their own journey. Everyone, you know, brings their own perspective because of that journey. Uh, so, you know, even if you feel like you're way off and, oh my God, I can never get into sport because I feel like I'm two roads down. But the reality is that there's always a way back in because there's always a different perspective and a unique perspective that you can bring to the table. So think about what that is. Uh, and when you have these discussions, when you go out and network with people and, you know, have these informational sessions, it's not so much I, I want a job, but hey, what do you do? And, you know, this is my background, what you recommend, what, you know, what do you suggest? And just have those you know, conversations. And there's a lot that you can pick up from those conversations to help you then, uh, you know, assess uh, where, where your goals are and, and what is it that, it that really interests you. Yeah. And define your path in, in your own specific uh, career. Um, right. That helps you differentiate you then. Yeah. Dwayne, do you want to share your advice to athletes who want to uh, become coaches? Yeah, I think, you know, you have to figure out what type of coach, you know, what level do you want to be at? The first thing, though, know, that's the hardest part. I mean, do you want to be a, 
you know, in the Snoop Dogg League being the coach of Pop Warner? Or do you want to be at the highest level? You know, that's the hardest thing. I mean, you know, like I said, I'm in the middle. So uh, it, it, it's hard to, to say that, you know, you want to work for, you know, not great pay at the beginning, you know, and work your way up. I mean, you got to, I mean, it's hard to figure out what, you, you know, there's junior college, you know, there's all kinds of places. It's just, you got to find your niche. And it's hard to find your niche when you have voices, people's other voices telling you what you should do. So you're going to have to, those people out there who want to become a coach, you have to sit down and say, you know what, this is what I want to do. And this is what's going to help my family or my family that's coming up or whatever. This is what we're going to do. And you got to make it, that's the hard thing to do. And you got to write, you know, you got, like Lindsay said, you got to write those letters. I mean, I wrote 250 of them, you know, back when writing was popular. Now, it's not, you know, I wrote 250. One person got back to me, right? So it kind of started my whole journey. You know, but I mean, it, you, just have to, you have to get out because coaches will answer because we like to talk. You know, we will answer questions. You know, yeah. just, that's the hard part. Yeah, and, and having a plan, um, figuring out what the different elements of the job that you, you want to target um, and then having a plan to reach that, I think really. But you're going to get fired, so get ready for it. <laughs> yes, especially with coaches, right? Yes, that's the beauty. And I think, are you actually touching on one point before we go to Rachel? I think this is really important. We didn't really talk about it in terms of sport, the sports performance industry. There's a lot of rejection and it's something that you need to get used to. Uh, it's not necessarily a, a evaluation of uh, an assessment of your personal value. It's just the way the industry is. Um, so I think that was a good point to bring up. Uh, Rachel, you're going to be our last word for the day. So uh, uh, any sure. additional advice? That's no a lot pressure. of pressure. Um, yeah, you know, I was thinking, I talked about experience earlier. And right now, I mean, it's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to get experience right now because um, athletes, you, you can't just go observe. You can't, we're not having session training sessions. So um, like everyone's mentioned, you need to reach out, write letters or um, reach out via social media. It's going to take some work. You can find emails. Um, I have uh, kids all the time that are graduating that will write me emails and say, hey, can I come ask you questions or can I come talk to you? And I'm always happy to, to help. I've got on the phone and done it. Um, usually the coaching world is, um, we, we all understand what it's like. We've been in that position and we're happy to help. Um, or like Dwayne said, we like to talk. So um, reach out. Um, there was one other one and I forgot it now, but um, oh, if you're going, you know, if you're thinking about strength conditioning, now would be a great time to um, start working on certifications because that's not going to make or break you, but it is a requirement. And, um, you know, if you don't have that on your resume, I, it's going to be, you're not going to really be considered. So those are two things that for my field, I can say would be doable right now. Yeah. And, and I guess we're going to, we're going to end on that, those points, networking, ongoing education and learning. Um, I'm thinking I forgot, I forgot quite a few, uh, but those are the, like the two summaries that we are reaching out, never saying yes, and never saying no, always saying yes, um, in, in reaching out, writing those letters for sure, trying to uh, get a foot in the door. Um, well, this was amazing. Thank you so much for your contribution, uh, sharing everything you've learned. I love that we've had different perspective and experiences, and I think we were able to brought up uh, quite a lot of, of point and, and, think to, and things to think about. So I think that was really helpful. And uh, thank you so much for your contribution to uh, the call to Athlete Soul and, and helping athletes and ongoing, an ongoing help that you have with athletes. So I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you. thank you. Thank you so much. You have a, a great weekend. All right. Thank bye you. bye now. Bye. Bye.